can you cut a square into equal area triangles? Well, how about into two equal area triangles? Yeah, you just slice it down the diagonal. What about into four equal area triangles? Yeah, you just slice it down both diagonals. What about into six equal area triangles? Yes. What about into three equal area triangles or into five equal area triangles? Can you cut a square into any odd number of triangles, each having the same area? So that's our question for today. Can a square be divided into an odd number of triangles, each having the same area? So this is a question that could have been asked, you know, 2,000 years ago. And I suppose, you know, it even has the modern application of trying to split a square sandwich among five friends. So that's our question. Can a square be divided into an odd number of equal area triangles, triangles that each have the same area? Now, the answer is no, it cannot be done. This is due to Monsky in 1970, but the real question is why not? Like that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, there are two ingredients to this proof, Sperner's lemma and a two-attic valuation. So let's tackle Sperner's lemma uh, first. So what does Sperner's lemma say? Well, if we triangulate a square, you know, meaning that I cut it up into triangles and then I color each of the uh, vertices, either A, B, or C, then the number of A, B edges on the perimeter and the number of A, B, C triangles have the same parity, they're congruent modulo two. And an A, B edge in the perimeter means uh, an edge that has a vertex that's colored A and a vertex that's colored B. And an ABC triangle means a triangle that has a vertex colored A, B, and C. And I'll shade uh, three such triangles. Now, sometimes these triangles are called complete triangles because the three vertices use all the, the three colors. So this is the statement of Sperner's lemma. Now, no matter how you triangulate, no matter how you color the vertices, the number of AB edges on the perimeter and the number of ABC, these complete triangles, is congruent modulo two. So here I'll color the ver uh, vertices indifferently, and now there are two, one, two AB edges, and also one, two ABC triangles. Let's prove Sperner's lemma. Our proof is the classic uh, pebble counting proof. On the inside of each square, on each side of an AB edge, I'll place a pebble. In the usual game uh, that combinatorialists like to play, we're gonna count those pebbles, but in two different ways. Each ABC triangle gives one pebble but other triangles might give either zero pebbles or two pebbles. In either case, the number of pebbles is congruent modulo two to the number of ABC triangles. Now let's count the pebbles uh, in a different way. Each AB edge on the perimeter gives one pebble. Other edges, edges that aren't AB edges might involve zero pebbles, or if they're an interior AB edge, then they'll include two pebbles. Summing all these up, the number of pebbles is congruent modulo two to the number of AB edges on the perimeter. We previously saw that the number of ABC triangles is congruent to the number of pebbles modulo two. And we just saw that the number of AB edges on the perimeter is also congruent to the number of pebbles modulo two. So what we've proved, we've proved Sperner's lemma, we've proved that the number of AB edges on the perimeter has the same parity as the number of ABC triangles. Now to emphasize this, for any triangulation, for any coloring, the number of perimeter AB edges and the number of complete of ABC triangles are congruent modulo two. So they're both odd or they're both even. In particular, if we can somehow prove that there's an odd number of AB edges on the perimeter, then there's an odd number of ABC complete triangles. And in particular, the number one is odd. So if we can somehow prove that there's an odd number of AB edges on the perimeter, then we can conclude that there's an ABC triangle. And this is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna be using Sperner's lemma exactly this way later to guarantee the existence of an ABC triangle. So we've got two ingredients in our proof and we've just seen Sperner's lemma. Now let's take a look at these two attic valuations. Oh, but before we take a look at two attic valuations, let's just talk about uh, valuations. Absolute value is an example of a valuation. It's a, it's a way of measuring how big a number is, or to be more precise, a valuation is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, which is non-negative. Zero is the only number uh, with valuation zero, and it's multiplicative. So the valuation of the product is the product of the valuations. 
and it satisfies the triangle inequality. So the valuation of x plus y is no bigger than the valuation of x plus the valuation of y. You might recognize these properties from uh, absolute value. So are there any other examples? Are there any other evaluations besides absolute value? Well, here's an example, a two-addict valuation. A rational number, p over q, can be written as a power of two times an odd number divided by an odd number. This is really just pulling out the even part of x, but it works even if x isn't a whole number. Then we define the two-addict valuation of x to be one-half raised to the exponent on the power of two that we pulled out. Now, just like absolute value, this is a way of measuring uh, the size of a number. But small here means something different. It means divisible by lots of twos. So here are some examples. Uh, just to get a feeling for how this works, we'll do some computations. The two-addict valuation, any valuation of zero is zero. Now, that doesn't quite fit into our formula, so it's important to uh, emphasize uh, that the two-addict valuation of zero is, a, is actually equal to zero. And the two-addict valuation of one is one. The two-addict valuation of two is one-half. The two-addict valuation of six is also one-half, since six and two both have a factor of two. The two-addict valuation of four is one-fourth. Now, similarly, the two-addict valuation of uh, 20, which is four times five, is also one-fourth. The two-addict valuation of uh, one-third is one. I mean, there aren't any twos in one-third. Similarly, the two-addict valuation of uh, five-thirds is also one. And the two-addict valuation of one-fourth is four, keeping to the idea that the two-addict valuation is large when there's a big power of two in the denominator. Uh, the two-addict valuation of one-twentieth and one-fourth, they both got the same number of twos. So the two-addict valuation of one-twentieth is also four. And likewise, for three-twentieths, it's also four. And for a 13 sixteenths, the two-addict valuation is 16. So with the two addicts, there are some slogans. And a big slogan is this one, all triangles are isosceles. In general, a valuation satisfies the triangle inequality. So the valuation of x plus y is less than or equal to the valuation of x plus the valuation of y. This is part of the definition of valuation. But for a two-addict valuation, uh, we actually have uh, something stronger. The toetic valuation of x plus y is less than or equal to the larger of the valuation of x and the valuation of y, with equality when the toetic valuations of x and y differ. So if the toetic valuation of x and y are the same, you've got an isosceles triangle. And if they're different, then the third leg of that triangle, x plus y, has toetic valuation equal to the maximum of the toetic valuations of x and y. So again, it's an isosceles triangle. There's a, maybe a little delicate point here. I mean, we've been computing the two-addict valuation for rational numbers. So how would we compute the two-addict valuation of an irrational number? What does that even mean? Well, what does it mean to ask for the two-addict valuation of root three? So let's, uh, let's think in terms of the definition of valuation. One of the properties was that the valuation was multiplicative. So what's the valuation of root three squared? Well, it must be the valuation of 3, and the two-addict valuation of 3 is 1. So we must have the two-addict valuation of root 3 is also 1. It's the positive square root of 1. This is maybe surprising. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to factor 2 uh, out of root 3. You know, but what we're morally saying here is that root 3 doesn't involve any 2s. What about the square root of 2? What's the two-addict valuation of root 2? And again, by multiplicativity, we must have the two-addict valuation of root 2 squared is the two-addict valuation of 2 which is one half. Consequently, the two-addict valuation of root two must be the square root of one half. So we can handle roots. What about other real numbers? I mean, what's the two-addict valuation of pi? The axiom of choice uh, can be invoked to show that there is a two-addict valuation defined for all real numbers, but as is often the case with objects whose existence is established only by invoking choice, we can't write down such an example. I should also mention uh, that in the proof that follows, choice is, is not actually needed. So the theorem that we're going to be proving, Monsky's theorem, doesn't depend on, on choice. So let's review. We'll write absolute value bars with the subscript 2 to denote the two-addict valuation of x. And morally, the two-addict valuation measures uh, how many times 2 divides x, or the size of x from 2's perspective. 
And the key observation uh, that we're going to use is that parity is related to these two attic valuations. For even integers, the two attic valuation is less than one. And for odd integers, the two attic valuation is bigger than or equal to one. So at this point, we've seen both Sperner's lemma and a two-attic valuation, and now it's time to combine those two things. Recall our original question. We want to show that a square cannot be cut into an odd number of equal area triangles. So far, we have Sperner's lemma and a two-attic valuation. So how will we combine uh, these two tools to show that a square cannot be cut into an odd number of equal area triangles? Well, we're going to do a sort of paint by number uh, where we use the two-attic valuation to decide what color to give each vertex. So let's start the proof. We suppose that we have a triangulation of a square into n equal area triangles. And we'll color the vertex with coordinates x, y with the color a uh, if the two-attic valuation of both x and y are less than 1. And we'll color it with color b if the two-attic valuation of x is bigger than or equal to 1 and the two-attic valuation of x is greater than or equal to y's. And we'll color the vertex C if these two cases uh, don't happen, right? Specifically, if the two-attic valuation of Y is greater than or equal to 1, and the two-attic valuation of X is less than that of Y. So our goal is to prove that N is even, meaning that it isn't possible to divide a square into an odd number of equal area triangles. So let's draw a picture to get a feeling for how this coloring uh, proceeds. So we imagine that our unit square is positioned with its bottom left-hand corner at the origin at 0, 0. It gets the color A, since the two-attic valuation of 0 is 0, which is less than 1. The point 1, 0 gets the color B, and the point 0, 1 gets the color C, and the point 1, 1 gets the color B. Now, every vertex in the bottom edge gets the color A or B. Everything on the uh, left edge gets the color A or C. Everything on the right edge, every point is colored either B or C. And on the top edge, every point is uh, either B or C. So where are the AB edges on the perimeter? Well, they must all be on the bottom edge. It's basically a one-dimensional version of uh, Sperner's lemma at this point. There's a point colored A as the left-hand endpoint, and there's a point colored B as the right-hand endpoint. So there's an odd number of AB edges on that bottom edge of that unit square. So by Sperner's lemma, that forces the existence of an ABC triangle. Now, what do we know so far? Well, if we color the vertices using the two-attic valuation, as we just described, then in any triangulation of the square, there's an ABC triangle. Now, if that triangulation into N triangles is into N equal area triangles, then the area of that ABC triangle, or well, any of the triangles, is 1 over N. Now, the key insight is that the area of a triangle is related to the color of its vertices. And in fact, if R is the area of an ABC triangle, then the two-attic valuation of R is greater than or equal to 2. So the two-attic valuation of 1 over N is at least 2, so N is even, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. Now, to simplify the situation, let's consider an ABC triangle, which has its A vertex on the origin at 0, 0. And we already saw that 0, 0 is colored with the A color. There's a formula for the area of a triangle in terms of its vertices, the coordinates of its vertices. You might recognize this as one half the determinant of a certain matrix. In any case, the area of the ABC triangle is R, and R is one half times XBYC minus XCYB. We take the two-attic valuation of everything. The two-attic valuation of a half is two. Now, the two-attic valuation of XBYC is not the same as the two-attic valuation of XCYB. This is because the two-attic valuation of xb is greater than or equal to the two-attic valuation of yb, but the two-attic valuation of yc is strictly larger than the two-attic valuation of xc. So by the all triangles are isosceles uh, slogan that we saw earlier, we have the two-attic valuation of r is twice the maximum of the two-attic valuations of xbyc and xcyb. But we actually know which one of those is larger. XBYC is the larger one. And by multiplicativity, we have the two-attic valuation of R is twice the valuation of XB times the valuation of YC. But both these two-attic valuations are greater than or equal to 1. So the two-attic valuation of R is at least 2. And that's exactly what we wanted to show, albeit in the special case where the A vertex was at the origin at 0, 0. Now, in the general case, we have an ABC triangle with an A vertex at XAYA, a B vertex at XBYB, and a C vertex at XCYC. Translating that ABC triangle by minus XA minus YA preserves the colors. And consequently, the special case that we already studied shows that the two-attic valuation of R is greater than or equal to 2. 
Okay, so how does this all fit together? Well, suppose we divided a unit square into n equal area triangles. So each of those triangles has area r equal to one over n. By multiplicativity, the two-adic valuation of n times r is one. But if we color the vertices in our triangulation, apply Sperner's lemon to get an ABC triangle, and then use our calculation for the two-adic valuation of the area r, we find that the valuation of r is greater than or equal to two. So the two-adic valuation of n is no bigger than a half. And in particular, the two-adic valuation of n is less than one. So n is divisible by two, n is even. And that's actually what we wanted to prove. So there's a ton of uh, interesting generalizations. Uh, for other polygons, for instance, you can define the spectrum of a polygon to consist of those numbers n for which the polygon can be divided into n equal area triangles. Uh, this particular one shown here, this right angle trapezoid, is a case that, that's been considered for various choices of, of alpha. And if you want to learn more, uh, the original article by Monsky is extremely readable. There's also a super fun book by Stein and Sander, Algebra and Tiling, Homomorphisms in the Service of Geometry. I just highly recommend this book.